Welcome to How to Split a Toaster, a divorce podcast about saving your relationships from True Story FM. Today, we're going to talk about the bread. Welcome to the show, everyone. I'm Seth Nelson. I'm here with my good friend, Pete Wright. Our guest today is Linda Murphy. She's the founder of the Relationship and Divorce Counseling Center, where she and her colleagues work to help others through difficult relationship transitions. Linda, welcome to the toaster. Thank you so much. I'm happy to be here. This is, you know, this this podcast is dedicated to saving relationships. And we we like to say that we we try to focus on all the relationships, not just the relationship with your potentially soon-to-be former spouse, but, you know, all the relationships in your life. Uh, but it it is fairly rare that we talk about what happens before the divorce process starts, right? We Everything we've talked about really is, you know you're on this path to divorce. It's going to end. It's difficult. It's volatile, whatever the case. But you're here today to help us talk about the before stage, that part of the relationship where you're not sure if divorce is the outcome. You think it might be, but is there something to salvage? Uh, what? How do you guide people in your capacity as a counselor when they're struggling in their marriage and just don't know how to chart a path forward? People come to me for individual counseling and couples counseling when they're trying to make that decision, right? So sometimes the person comes as an individual and they say, "I can't, I can't fathom how this could move forward." And I need help to just wrap my head around what I could possibly do on my end to save this marriage. Or I need somebody to help me to just look at what has happened in the marriage and tell me whether or not it's possible to move forward. So that's like on the individual end of counseling where people are coming for that reason. And then I have also, like you were saying, the couples that come in and maybe one or both of them have an inkling that the relationship is at the end. And sometimes uh, one partner is pretty sure and the other partner has no clue. So it just, you know, I get I get all sorts of um, Mm -hmm. variety Mm -hmm. in that. And then it's my job to create a safe space for these couples to come and discuss this very big decision that they have to make. And it's not easy. And a lot of counselors that do couples counseling do not enjoy this work. And so they tend to send them my way when (laughs) they hear that the couple is interested in, you know, maybe getting a divorce. (laughs) Wow, you have you corner the market on tough divorce counseling situations. Yeah, and and I really enjoy it. So yeah. for me, you know, that's not a hard conversation to be in on. But for a lot of couples counselors, they pride themselves on saving marriages, right? And so to have somebody walk in the door already thinking that that might be the outcome, that's pretty discouraging. Mm-hmm. And that was going to be my question is because I think a lot of couples counselors they view their job as saving the relationship. And I hate those terms, saving, not, I just think that we're all on this journey and, and sometimes people come into our lives for a short period of time and some a very long period of time and more intimate and longer and they're married or whatever the case may be. So that was going to be one of my questions to you is when they are talking to you, you don't have any preconceived outcomes you're creating a space for them to have an open dialogue on whether or not they want to continue in this relationship. And if so, what needs to change to make that happen? Is that a fair assessment? 100%. And, you know, I do, I do agree with you. I think sometimes when a couple's counselor is working with a couple and let's say they save the relationship, everything gets better. They pat themselves on the back of, oh, look what I did. And I have no ownership in it at all, right? Like I am going to use research-based techniques to help the couple, but really whether or not they stay together or not, it's it doesn't have a lot to do with me and has a lot more to do with 
you know, what they're wanting for their life. So if in the end they decide to not stay together, I I can't beat myself up for that. Just the same as I can't pat myself on the back if they were to stay together. It's so, about their life. So on these research-based techniques is what I understand you use to help people have an open conversation about whether or not to stay in the relationship. So if one of our listeners is already getting a divorce, some things we're talking about today might be helpful in their next relationship. Is that is that fair? 100%. And that's where like I also do post-divorce counseling, right? So or during the divorce counseling for couples and individuals as well. So what that might look like is an individual comes to me they just realize that divorce is inevitable. Maybe they're sleeping on their friend's couch or they're trying to figure out what life is going to look like and they're devastated and they're trying to wrap their head around this big life-changing transition and I can help guide them through that. In addition to that, Couples will come to me knowing that they already want to get a divorce. And before they're even talking to lawyers, they just kind of want to know what is this going to look like? And, you know, what, what should we even be talking about now before we go see a lawyer? And so I can have a lot of those conversations with them. Again, creating that safe space to talk about things that are really uncomfortable. Seth, I, I got a question for you. When, how often in this light, how often do people come to you having already gone through a discernment process like this, like, like Linda's talking about? One of the questions I always ask is, have you been to counseling? It, you know, is there anything you want to do or try that you haven't? So you can put your head on the pillow at night to say, I've done everything I can to make this relationship work. Yeah. And th- then they'll usually say for my kids or for my, religious beliefs, but inevitably it's for what's in their heart, right? In, in their core. Okay. And I will hear, yes, we've tried. No, my partner will not go. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that's a sign in itself. Right. That's a problem. Yeah, that's telling. Then, but sometimes, which happens, um, we will file for divorce. And then the partner will be like, I'll go to counseling. Yeah. <laughs> And so Linda's had that, right? <laughs> yeah. 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 Unfortunately, um, even in just regular couples counseling, you will find that a lot of people are going past the point of return, right? So maybe they should have gone two years prior. And now there's so little motivation to change. So much hurt has been caused. So much trust is broken that, I mean, it takes a lot to be able to fix it. And specifically, that motivation piece is so important that if there's not enough motivation in either partner, And sometimes it just takes one partner to have it. And I always tell that partner, you've got to put on your superhero cape and do all of the work because your partner's checked out. If someone's already checked out, is there ever getting them back? Are they checking back in? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, you can absolutely check back in, especially if there's empathy for the partner along the way, right? So, you know, let's say that your partner has disappointed you over and over and over. Well, if that partner's the one with the energy to change the relationship and keep it going, just seeing your partner do some of the things, even just showing up for counseling can inspire the motivation on the other partner's behalf to like really start themselves. And yeah, I mean, I just, I will let the partner who has to wear that superhero cape know, I'm going to be hard on you. You're going to have to do it all. And I'm going to be hard on you because you're paying me to help save this relationship. And that's all I've got. But with that too, they also get to say, I'm going to put on that cape and I am going to fight the fight. I'm going to you know, be this superhero, but ultimately they also have a decision to be like, I'm done. I'm putting in all this effort 
and I can't get the my partner to take one step, right? Right, right, 100%. And that happens where the partner is just too far gone. And it's it's sad. What but. what what does that look like? I mean, Pete's been happily married for years. He can't imagine any of this even happening, right, Pete? Well, yeah. I mean, I just just thinking about that. Like, there are I I I imagine knowing full well that every relationship is a unique and special snowflake. But I imagine that there are signs and signals that you look for when you're working with a couple or with individuals that'll tell you, hey, this is. You're on the road to, to you need we need to call it you know flag on the field or you know I know it's hard right now but what I'm seeing is there's hope yes and I would say that I can always see hope unless there's some sort of abuse going on when there's abuse I can't work with you and that's not just like I don't feel like it it's not safe to work with a couple if there's abuse going on. Well, and you just you just uh, dropped the podcast, uh, legal podcast trigger word. If there is abuse going on, please call 911. Please call your local authorities. Make sure you get yourself into a safe uh, situation. There are resources to help. Yeah, 100%. So I will then, if I see abuse going on, I will then say, these are your resources. This is what I suggest that you do. There are counselors that I can, you know, refer out to that work with people who are abusive and can give me the heads up of like, okay, I think this person's ready for couples counseling again. Then I might bring them back in again. So back to these signs that Pete was kind of referring to. As a counselor, you see it, like you're trained for it, you work with it daily. But if you're in a relationship or you're post-divorce and you're in a new relationship, what signs should you look for? How do you even know you should look? I mean, a lot of people tell me, oh, I just thought we were going through a hard time. Just like Pete said, all couples go through a hard time. How, how do you know the difference between we're just going through a hard time and, oh my God, this ship's about to crash into these rocks? Yeah, I mean, it's different for everybody, right? I Some people have been in relationships for lifetimes that have been miserable and they wouldn't look back on it and go, I wish I had left. They maybe found value in staying together in some way, shape or form. So I, again, I always keep the hope unless there's abuse. But if I see that both people are actively working to not fix the relationship, that is also a sign to me, not that there's no hope, but that couples counseling is not the tool that's going to help them. So in those cases, I will refer out to other counselors for individual therapy just to kind of work on really understanding, do you want to be in this relationship? Because sometimes people will pretend, right? That's that's really the only other time. Abuse, and then when somebody is pretending to do the work of couples counseling, but they're not actually doing it. They, they show up to meetings with you, but it's obvious that they are not flossing between sessions. No, exactly. <laughs> exactly. And there's, you know, if for me, I think we're going to get like a thousand downloads just from dentists now. <laughs> I feel it coming. Pete. Yeah, that's the title, too. We just locked in the title. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Love it. Yeah, but there's there's I usually no matter what can find hope in any relationship as long as the couple wants me to continue to have the hope. It's I find for me it's not my decision to make. And again, so the- take me take me through that. Pete and I are having troubles, we're having marital difficulties, we're in your mm-hmm. office. You just don't know what it's like to work with this man. <laughs> First, First I'd like to say, you see, Pete did something wrong. He's blaming it all on me. <laughs> and your point is you need to work on yourself. Is that right, Linda? That's correct. Okay. Deflection. No, so, Deflection. So, yeah. <laughs> so the first session, I always bring the couple in together and I just observe what it looks like as they're interacting and how they are talking about their relationship with the other person in the room. And 
I find out information about the major issues that have gone in on any traumatic situations and, you know, what their love story was. Then the next two sessions, I always meet with them individually and I let them know that that's the time that you get to talk about your partner without having to worry about hurting his or her feelings. And that's when you really get to see what the experience of the person is. And on my end, my goal is to try to connect with their experience because that allows me to, if I can fully empathize with their experience, it allows me to never take sides, right? Which can be horrible for couples counseling if your couples counselor seems to obviously side with one or the other person. I hear that all the time. I went to counseling, but. It sounds so ridiculous to hear you say it. Like, why would a counselor ever do that? But we hear that all the time yes. when it's obvious. And what I always tell them in that first session, too, is if you ever feel like I'm doing that, I want you to tell me you're feeling that way because I want to be able to have a chance to voice to you why I'm doing that. And then when I am doing, you remember we were talking about the superhero thing, when I kind of go hard on the superhero, I will like look at them and go, I know how hard this is. I wish I didn't have to do this to keep them recognizing that this is not me trying to bully you into thinking you're the problem. This is the only tool I have. And, and the, the other thing that drives me nuts too, just to, to go to that is when people come to me and they say, we tried couples counseling and it didn't work. So now we're here for divorce counseling. It breaks my heart too, because sometimes you just need to try a new counselor. Maybe the counselor wasn't the right fit. And I, I'm not saying that the counselor was horrible, but it's like finding a best friend. You have to really trust the person. And if you don't trust them, then things like feeling like the counselor is taking one side or the other does happen. Oh, it becomes really easy to to make up some stories that yes. feel really true. Yeah, yeah. So, and then, so I meet with them individually. I get that sense of, you know, what's happening internally for each person, trying to understand their perspective. And then we come back together and I talk through what I believe the biggest issues are in their relationship and get feedback from whether or not I'm on the right track. And this is a hunch that I have on that, Linda. They're not the issues that they came in with. Right. Yeah, it's never the issue they're talking about. Those are the symptoms, right? That, that what they'll express will be the symptoms to the real issue. Right, right. It's it's the, like the joke. It's never about the dishes. And so it's my job to, like I said, really get in touch with the individual's feelings and help them to be able to express those in a different way. And um, in addition to that, I help them to understand what schemas, and I'll explain what schemas are, but what schemas are impacting their behaviors. So I would describe schemas as kind of like if you put on lenses, like glasses, right? And the glasses are all of a sudden changing how you view the world. That's what a schema is. So for example, somebody might have an abandonment schema. So they're at a party with their spouse, everything's going fine, their spouse decides to go over and talk to a new group of people, they stay away for too long, and now their partner, who might have an abandonment schema from childhood, these sunglasses come on and start to cloud their view of the situation, where they were once having a great time, all of a sudden, they're seeing that their partner doesn't love them, doesn't care about them, doesn't even want to hang out with them at this party. And now this story has been created about how awful the partner is. And so I help them to identify what those schemas are so that they can get to know each other's schemas. And um, hopefully, When these things come up, instead of it being like, he abandoned me at this party, she can look at it differently in those situations and go, oh my gosh, there's my schema. There it is. Yeah. Here it is. He's not even doing anything and I'm angry. 
it gets back to just how much, I, and I think this this is might be an assumption, at least that I've run into in my rigorous empirical uh, research, <laughs> uh, that that couples counseling or relationship slash divorce counseling is about the relationship. But uh, I, I want to reinforce the relationship is about how you approach this this marriage as an individual. Right. Yeah. You know, I think the schema point is a very good point. Yeah. And, and I'll just share that I know that I have inclusion issues, I call them. What is so, that? Yeah, I know. I'd like to be included or invited or considered. So, mm-hmm. and I, this comes up with my girlfriend all the time. And it's just the way we communicate. And I'll, so sometimes she'll say something like, oh, um, I might be taking this trip with my girlfriends or they're, they're planning something really fun. And I'll say, well, I thought we might've had something planned or she's take, and I, it's not like I want to be invited to go out with her girlfriends. That's not what I'm saying. It's like, but now you're not spending time with me when I thought we were going to be spending time. So I'm not included in, in your life for that moment. And she's going to say, no, I'm just saying, I want to make sure that it didn't conflict with the time that we were going to go on vacation. But that's not what I heard the first time. Sure. I heard the yeah. first time she was choosing her friends to hang out with, not me. I'm not included in her life. Yeah. How'd I do, Linda? Yeah, perfect. There's your schema, right? Yeah. And so those I needed lenses. you like last week before we got in that fight, not this week. <laughs> you know? No. <laughs> there was no fight. You know? <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. One of my schemas is um, I will put on the lenses of wanting to do things right and it's really hard for if somebody gives me feedback of not doing it right, that it makes me feel bad about myself. So any feedback, I have to always remind myself that they're like, you know, my husband isn't saying that to make me feel dumb in this moment, right? It's like that it's it's just the schema that comes over me and his intentions are not to bring that schema up within me. His intentions are simply just to point out that I forgot to close the garage door, right? But for me, it's like, oh, I didn't do it right or I forgot or, you know, and it just, it eats at me with that. So we all have them. We all have them. I got, I got one. You guys each have one. I want to tell one. Uh, Okay. Mine's uh, rejection sensitivity. Like I, and I think it's part of what I do is, you know, when you put creative works like podcasts out of the world, this is what leads me to perseverate for weeks on the one negative comment about the one person who doesn't like how I articulate my P's or something ridiculous like that. And I do find that very annoying. Oh, see what you're doing there, you <laughs> troll. Uh, and, and so I'll think about that for a month and I'll completely disregard all of the the good stuff that comes out right. of people whose whose lives are are in any way helped by what we do. And so I am I, that that RSD, that rejection sensitivity is those those lenses are dark when I bring those yes. down. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, in moments like that, just being able to go, if I took these lenses off right now, how might I see this differently? Yeah. This exact situation. Could I see it a different way? So because, Pete, in yeah. all seriousness, is that yeah. why you always read the one star reviews on Google first on other products? A hundred percent. Absolutely. We go to the one stars first. And and I don't I, I don't imagine I'm alone. And I imagine this this rears its head in the the counseling process, right? The the idea that any conversation uh, that becomes in any way critical between partners uh, m- might be subject to rejection sensitivity and magnifying negative commentary between partners wildly out of scope. Right. And, you know, the, the term I would use for it is unrealistic expectations of yourself. And maybe others too, oftentimes people who have that schema. And so we share that one, even though mine may look slightly different, that is actually under that same umbrella of just unrealistic expectations of yourself. And everybody has this, everybody. And so getting to know your partners and then having them get to know yours, you can start to, you know, you see kind of that cloud coming over your partner's face and you can go, oh, what was it? Which schema was it? What did I do there? Right. What How- nerve did I just touch? What button did I push? 
Because right. unless you're in a really bad relationship or in an argument where the partner is actually trying to be mean to you and to be hurtful in what they say, generally speaking, I know that my girlfriend never is intentionally trying to exclude me. Right. She's never intentionally trying to hurt me. And it's more about my shit than anything that she's doing. <laughs> I mean, mm-hmm. and then I'll get that look and she'll be like, and she knows the look, right? Like, it, it, what did I do? I, I'm, I'm just, try, I'm cracking a joke. I'm trying to make you laugh. And I'll be like, no, nah, it, it's me on this one, like, or <laughs> so it, it's. But right. we can communicate about it, and when you actually talk about the exchange of information and how you're communicating, it immediately changes the subject because I'm no longer talking about not feeling included or feeling excluded. I'm talking about how we communicate with each other because, and she says, no, I wasn't trying to exclude you. Just the opposite. I was trying to include you in my life by figuring out when it all works for all of us. Um, Mm -hmm. And I know that you told me you had a trial that month. So I'm trying to figure it out. I know you'll be working. So just talking about the interaction, I think is helpful. Yeah. Well, and I, I think we're getting to the we we've just sort of painted the answer to this question, uh, but I'm going to ask it anyway. In your experience, Linda, when you when you come up with people who are in the divorce process but haven't gone through counseling, what usually is the barrier for them to actually take that leap and go talk to a professional like yourself and actually do the work before the divorce? It blows my mind, right? Because I can see the value in it. So I would. Just say, um, wondering what other people will think that they can't do it on their own. Yeah. Um, I mean, and yet they're going to get a divorce. So everybody will know anyway that they couldn't do it. It, it just, well, you, you kind of look like you, you hire Seth because you can't get a divorce on your own. So <laughs> right. why would you not hire somebody to help you, you know, live together uh, in a relationship? Right. And, and we all don't have perfect examples of parents that show us how to manage conflict. You know, we're, we're all human. And even for myself, if I were thinking about divorce or having major issues in my relationship, I know a lot about relationships, but I can't be objective. You know, I can't, I would need somebody else to give me feedback about what I could do differently. Which and, plays right into your not perfect problem. Yeah, so yep, that's going to yep. be hard. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But what's interesting to me about this, ab- about people not wanting to go to counseling, one, is there is, I think, a fear of that is just a step along the way to divorce. It's almost like you check the box. Oh, we tried counseling. Now we get divorced. So if I never try counseling, we'll never get divorced. Check your local jurisdictions. Isn't it required in many states to go through counseling in order to like it's a gate you have to cross that mandated, right? Not in Florida. I don't know of any jurisdiction that requires counseling. Mm. There are jurisdictions that say you have to wait so long. After you file, there's a separation period before you can get divorced. In Florida, you have to allege in your filings with the court that the marriage is irretrievably broken. So any celebrity that you see in the paper getting divorced in Florida, that's going to be the quote, irretrievably broken, which I laugh at because it's a required thing you have to say to get a divorce. Yeah. Now, in Florida... The judge will ask you, is there anything I can do to help you save your marriage, such as going to counseling? And if you say, yeah, judge, that might help, you can file a motion and it's up to the judge to say, yeah, I'm going to send you guys to counseling. But the judges all are human. They look at the other person and say, is it going to help your side? And they're like, nope, I'm out. And the judge is like, I'm not going to order you. It takes two. But but it goes to the point, like it, counseling becomes a gate that you have to at some point address. And that doesn't do a lot for, you know, the reputation of pre-divorce marriage saving counseling. Yeah, I mean, it, I like like you were saying, I think that when you are 
asking your partner if they're willing to go to counseling, you are acknowledging that there's a really big problem. And if you want to avoid feeling like there's a really big problem, then you're not going to do that. Or if you've gotten any feedback from your partner that that's not a good idea or that it's shameful in some way, I mean, there's huge stigma with it as well. And I also I'm also assuming, Linda, that couples don't say it so nicely as you just did. I'm really <laughs> requesting that you join me in marriage counseling to help work on some issues that I believe we're having that you might not even believe are a problem. Like that's <laughs> not how it happens, right? Wait, you don't have a Zen gong in your in your uh, foyer, Seth, for all difficult conversations? <laughs> yeah. I do Sound a lot for everyone. Yeah, uh-huh. <laughs> I do. I do want to ask though. I, how do you know, Linda, when you're done? How do you know you finished your journey with this couple? One way or another, it, it's got to. You've got to be finished. You can't meet with these people forever. What do you do? They usually let me know. Um, I will, for example, when a couple is doing quite well and they're going to not need my services anymore, I will let them know that, hey, you know, things are seeming to be going pretty good. So do you feel like you need to see me every week at this point? Or do you think that we could spread it out, right? When it comes to people getting a divorce, They usually will let me know. I think we've talked about all we can talk about. And I always let them know, not a problem. If things come up in the future, like if you're having a hard time co-parenting and maybe you've got the plan completely drawn out and it is what it's going to be, but you're still struggling to communicate. Come on back. We Come can have on, a session. Come on, that never happens. Two people oh, that are divorced with kids having trouble communicating. Oh, <laughs> I thought you meant coming back. <laughs> but it's great. I mean, you can talk about like, you know, I've got a vacation coming up and I need your help. And will you be there for me if I need your help? And, you know, it's not your day. And mm-hmm. having me, again, to create that safe space to work through some of the things that they need support with. I'm happy to do it. You love those boomerang divorce clients. Keep them (laughs) coming back. Well, on that point, and here's just a quick example, and I get both sides of this transaction. You're in a divorce case, you mediated, and the dad fought for all this time and the mom's like, he's never going to use, he's never going to use, he's never going to use it, but to settle the case, I'll give him the time. And then that's the parenting plan. That's the time sharing, the custody visitation arrangement. And then dad is constantly pawning the kids off on mom and mom gets upset. And I, they'll call me and I'll say, what are you upset about? Well, he's never taking his days. And I'll say, you didn't want him to have those days in the beginning. Yeah. So what's changed? You're you're actually getting what you wanted. I know it doesn't match the parenting plan. And the issue then is not that the, the mom has the children. The issue is she can't plan. She feels like she's being his babysitter and his caregiver. There's all these other issues that don't get maybe discussed before. So kind of, I think what you're saying, Linda, with those glasses is I tell people, let's really get to what the problem is here. Yeah. And are you willing to deal with that because you get your kids more? And the answer might be, no, I'm not. I want to have a plan so I can schedule it. And I'm a guy that likes to plan and like to have a schedule. So I appreciate that. Um, That's one of my schisms as well. (laughs) Like, oh, Mm -hmm. the plan changed or we don't have a plan. I get very, you know. um, Thrown off. Yeah, yeah, thrown off or my (laughs) chest gets tight. But. I think defining what the issue really is for you is also key. Well, and I refer to that as what are your values, right? So identifying, you know, for let's say the mom, if dad checks out and isn't doing as much and she feels like she's helping him with the time that he fought for, um, what I'm hearing you say is you help the mom to try to identify what she might value about this change that he's he's really gifting her more time 
And that's what she really wanted to begin with. And how can we adjust to that and not allow it to bother her so much? And sometimes, like you said, pointing out that that's what you wanted to begin with. Or maybe you can point back to the children. When the children are in your care and they have that steady time with mom, are they functioning better? Are things better for them? And so even though this is a really hard thing that your schedule is all messed up, could we flip it and see it as a positive for everybody? Uh, when I was, um, it, we'd been married for two years and we went in for, uh, you know, a counseling checkup, mm-hmm. make sure we're communicating all right. You know, we were just in that sort of, hey, we're not newlyweds anymore. Now, what do we do? And yeah. At the end of about five weeks, the counselor says to both of us, you guys are doing great. Um, I I feel like I, you don't need me anymore. Takes a beat and then looks straight at me and says, Pete, I'd love to talk to you about your ADHD. I think that might be getting in the way of some things for you. And I said, what? <laughs> no idea. <laughs> I, I say all this as, as a, a, a truly got my ADHD, adult ADHD diagnosis in marriage counseling. Uh, <laughs> it, it was amazing. Uh, you want to say, don't change that. That's the only thing I love about it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, the, I, I say all that because I have to imagine, I mean, that led to a deep and wonderful relationship with my counselor who helped me through some very hard things. And uh, so I, I'm wondering if once, once they break the seal with you and do some of the hard stuff, does that transition more easily into longer term relationships on, you know, broader communications issues, relationship issues? I, I assume that's recommended post-divorce. What does that look like? Do you mean if they're coming to me as a couple and then they decide to get a divorce, maybe they work with me individually? Yeah. Sometimes. Um, if that does occur, I try to only work with one person or the other. And if the couple is done with me as a couple's counselor or divorce counselor, I will then have the couple sign off saying that one person's staying for individual and the other one is no longer my client. That legally protects them to make sure that the notes going moving forward are not able to be accessed by anybody, you know, subpoenaed or right. whatever. Certainly ethically protects you and your licensure. Yeah, yeah. 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 And right. so I do try to make it a very clear, you are no longer my client, and now I'm moving forward individually with somebody else. It sounds like what you're doing is finally, at long last, picking sides. Yeah. I wasn't going to say it, Pete. I thought about it. I wasn't going to say it. And I thought if I'm quiet enough, I bet you Pete will take the that joke, bait. The joke will emerge. Uh-huh. <laughs> and actually, that's what ends up happening, right? Because if you do start to see somebody individually for long enough, it does create this relationship with that person that it it becomes harder and harder to see both sides yeah. of the argument if if you're not, you know, um, able Engaging to separate yourself. Engaging with that yourself. side, yeah. Yes, right, yeah. Right. So um, that that's what I tend to do. And just, uh, just because it's interesting, uh, it's usually the partner who didn't want to come to couples counseling that stays with me for individual. Whoa, wow. I didn't see that. No, <laughs> that's, that's a real twist. <laughs> Which I always get a kick out of. I'm like, Wow, you were yeah. fighting it. And usually, I mean, that's what I always hear. A lot of men who think that they're not going to like couples counseling like it a whole lot more than they think they will. And maybe it is my ability to see both perspectives and stay neutral that they're not expecting and they enjoy it. I, I don't yeah. know, but I would tell you that the couples counselors that I know that I talk with, you know, they they both have that same goal of staying neutral in it. So it's unfortunate that people don't feel that way sometimes at the end. Yeah. Well, I can tell you that uh, as for me and Seth, uh, we're really grateful for your work with us in couples podcasting. I feel a lot better now, Pete, that we can (laughs) communicate. Uh, It's uh, you're Yeah, I really do. I feel super grounded. Now that you understand each other's schemas. The schemas. Yeah, Uh I'm watching. 
the schemas yeah. right now. Yeah. Though you've been great, Linda. Thank you so much for uh, for making the time to join us for this conversation. We sure appreciate it. You're welcome. I had so much fun. Uh, why don't you uh, give us a little plug? Where would you like people to go learn more about you? Well, um, you can go to my website at radcounseling.com. That stands for Relationship and Divorce Counseling.com. Did you stumble on that acronym or was that part of the design? It's so funny. At first, I was going to be divorce and relationship. Well, and my husband's like, counseling. <laughs> I know. My husband's like, dar, no. And then he flipped it. He's like, Rad! Yeah, it's perfect for my personality. Your, your too. husband is aces. That is a great, a, a great catch. <laughs> Her husband was like, "Rad counseling, you and I gotta go." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, Pete, I know she just said her website, but near and dear to my heart. Linda practices right here in the great state of Florida, and even better in Tampa. Hey, that's local. It's right here. It's great. And so I am sure that um, people listening in the local Tampa Bay area, we have a great counselor here. Um, Give Linda a look up and whether you need it for like we discussed today, divorce counseling, individual counseling. If you're in a relationship and you're thinking about maybe even getting married and you want to check in on, hey, is this right for me? Is it is it all working? Um, There's all sorts of stuff that Linda can provide. Linda, I cannot thank you enough for joining us. And I look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you guys so much. This is amazing. Thank you so much, Linda Murphy, for your time. Uh, And thank you, everybody, for downloading and listening to this show. Hey, are you listening to this podcast in an app? Does that app allow you to rate and review podcasts and share with others? then would you please do that with this podcast? We would love to hear uh, your comments. We prefer the positive ones, but we'll take all of them because we can always learn uh, in podcast directories uh, around the internet. Thank you, everybody, for your time and attention. On behalf of Linda Murphy and the great Seth Nelson, America's favorite family law attorney, I'm Pete Wright. We'll catch you next time right here on How to Split a Toaster, a divorce podcast about saving your relationships. Seth Nelson is an attorney with Nelson Coster Family Law and Mediation with offices in Tampa, Florida. While we may be discussing family law topics, How to Split a Toaster is not intended to, nor is it providing legal advice. Every situation is different. If you have specific questions regarding your situation, please seek your own legal counsel with an attorney licensed to practice law in your jurisdiction. Pete Wright is not an attorney or employee of Nelson Coster. Seth Nelson is licensed to practice law in Florida.